Good morning again. We're in the book of Second Corinthians this morning. Chapter two. A lot of twos. Second Corinthians chapter two. We'll look at verses fourteen through seventeen this morning. Psalm 19, half the psalm has to do with the Word of God. Pretty much what we're talking about this morning in these verses 14 through 17, God and His Word. Without a God, there is no Word. There's silence. But with God, there is the Word of God. He speaks to us in His Word. That is the place where God can be found. That is the place where God speaks. God speaks to us in his word. We can't help but look at the human side of it. You know, that's an astounding thing to me, that God took ordinary people like Paul and used them to write the word of God. Paul was a murderer. I don't think I would have picked Paul. But that's what God did. He picked a murderer, um, brought new life to him. Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. And God used all the stuff that was in Paul's life throughout the New Testament as Paul wrote about the transformation that God made in his life through the Word of God. And chapter 2 here that we've been in, um, if you're new to us and you're new to this section this is where we've been in our sunday school hour and paul's emotions are really on display in this book you cannot read this book without seeing paul paul's emotions he wears them on his sleeve Uh, he's very transparent he gets things out there for people to see and i'm so thankful for that because i find a lot of the things that paul went through are some of the things that we go through, and that's what this this book is about. Paul said, the comfort that God gave me, I want to pass on to you. So as Paul went through trials and troubles and learned things and learned how to trust God, he passed those things on to us, and God has given us this inspired book and given us this inspired letter. First Corinthians goes with it, so don't read Second Corinthians without first reading First Corinthians. You'll you'll learn a lot more about what's in second by just simply reading the first. There was about a year's difference between the writing of these two books, and Paul has been dealing with some very personal things. Uh, You know, they thought because he said he was going to come and he got delayed that, you know, Paul was one of those guys you really couldn't count on his word. He'd say one thing and do something else. So Paul deals with those things down through here, and uh And as we come now to verse 14 here, he says, Now thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. He makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that are perish, excuse me, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? And we are not as many who corrupt the word of God, but as sincerity and as uh, of God in the sight of God, speak we Christ. John, you want to open us in prayer this morning? Lord, thank you for your great goodness that you allow us to come in your presence this morning and to worship you for Christ. We know we have no merit of our own.
spoken to you. We pray you bless your word to our hearts. Amen. And your spirit would be given us understanding. <clears throat> we thank you for being a better God than we know or understand. We ask all these things for your glory and our good. Amen. Amen. You can't help but read the New Testament and see all these struggles that that Paul had and others had and not ask yourself, how, how did these guys do this? How, how did Paul write most of the New Testament? How did he start all these churches? How did he go and preach the gospel? How did he go in prison and get out of prison and go back in prison again? I mean, it's a phenomenal thing. People have written books on Paul's life, you know, and it's a... It's an amazing thing to look at these things that Paul went through and just not ask yourself, how did he do it? You know, he he must be some kind of superhuman being, right? You know, he he must have been, uh, you know, God must have went down to the, the gym and picked out the guy with the most muscle and the highest IQ and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and used him to do these great things for God. Well, you would be wrong. I know today it's monster energy, right? Got to get these monster energy drinks, and that's what keeps everybody going. With Paul, he, he didn't use monster energy drinks. He didn't have any of those, and I guess I, I've had a few myself, but they're not much when it comes to serving the Lord. But Paul was tuned in. You ask yourself how, you know, and, and Paul's humanity is on display for us. You know, God doesn't hide these things from us. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, and we have... 33 years of his life, we have the Gospels where the people who, who uh, grew up with him, the people who lived with him, the people who are around him, they talk about, about, about his humanity. It's on display for us to see God as a man. You know, that's, that's the amazing thing is God became a man. That's the incarnation. That's God with us. That's Emmanuel. So we see and learn some amazing things. And, you know, even Jesus wasn't some kind of superhuman. I mean, he was a man like you and I. He had, he had a mother and he had a father in heaven. But his humanity was on display for us to see. Paul as well, his humanity is on display for us to see. Now, Paul wasn't God. So, but, but Paul knew God and God, Paul was used in a great way by God. And Paul is here telling us, you know, he, he's not saying, well, here's how I did it, but that's our context. Here's how Paul did it. You know, he did it uh, by being thankful, as he says in verse 1, and he says, God always causes us to triumph, making manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So Paul says, this is the case wherever I go. And, you know, the ministry that Paul was in, it's, you know, it's like life. You know, life has uh, a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of anxiety in life. There's a lot of trouble, tribulation in life. Well, the ministry is, is uh, the same, if not worse. And we go through it as Christians. The church goes through it as well. So there's no perfect Christian. There's no perfect church. We're all, we're all in need of advancement. And God advances us by sending us trouble and tribulation. And that's what Paul talks about in these first two chapters. And you say, well, if that's, those are the facts, then Paul must be a miserable man. No, that's not what he says. He says in verse 14, thanks be to God. So right away, Paul, you see, Paul's thankful. Paul's thankful to God. And that's, that's where everything starts. That's where everything, you know, Paul reminds himself of God, you know, and that's what happens. You know, we go through the week or, or maybe some of you, you know, you've been through stuff. You haven't even been able to come to church. And some of you are back. But, you know, God, God wants, to, wants us to know he is here. Paul, uh, Paul went through all these anxious things that he talks about in chapter 2. But he starts out here in verse 14 by being thankful. And that's like the second or third time just here in just a verse or two. That, that Paul has, uh, has done this. So if we, if we don't have joy, joy, joy is one of those things that comes from thanks, being thankful. And Paul talked about joy here in this text. So in order to have joy, we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful. 
you know, some of you have difficult circumstances and sometimes we can't be thankful for our circumstances, but we can be thankful for God. And that's Paul. Paul's, he's all about God in chapters one and two. God is right in front of Paul as he, as he, uh, as he ministers to these people, as he writes these things. And Paul is not telling them how incredible he is. He's telling them how incredible God is. And he's telling them he's experiencing the trouble and the difficulties and, and, and uh, you know, always looking to God and to the goodness of God. Uh, I love over in chapter 1, verse 9, Paul was very honest over there in verse 9. He says that we should not trust in ourselves, but in the God who raises the dead. So some people may look at Paul's life and say, well, he must be really, you know, he must be really, uh, you know, one of those self guys, and he read all the self-help books, and he did all this stuff on his own. No, Paul says, no, I learned this from God. I'm like you, Paul says. I have to learn not to trust in myself, but in God. And Paul says here, who raises the dead, Paul was almost dead. Paul was written off as dead here in this text. And he says, I found out that God is greater than death. That's what God wants us to know about. It. Whatever comes our way, whatever trouble, we start out as young Christians, or maybe we're an unbeliever, and we're like, you know, I, I just don't see this God that you guys see. I, can't, I just don't know about this God. I can't, you know, once you get in the Word of God, and once you... Once you're faced with God, you're going to find out he's going to take you through little things that you can handle as a baby. And as you get older and you mature, God takes you through a little more and a little more. Next thing you know, you've been saved for several years. You look back on it and you say, wow, I'm trusting God. And that's what God wants. He wants our faith. It's faith that pleases Jesus. It's faith that pleases God. God wants us to trust him and trust his word and look to him, no matter the circumstances, no matter the trouble and to be thankful. That's what Paul says here. So he got a good report back from Titus. That's up there in verses 12 and 13. So that encouraged Paul. Um, he got a good report back from the church that they, they had discipline problem. They had sin in the church. They did a great job dealing with this. Paul is very pleased that um, they've forgiven this person. First, they punished them in verse 6. They have comforted them. He's forgiving them, and they're loving them in verses 6 seven and eight up there. So that's what's going on. So Paul's got a good report back about the ministry and about these things. And it's really encouraged him. And he says, thanks to God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ, makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So this is a little bit difficult in the King James, but i clean it up a little bit for you. It says, wherever I go, thank God, he made my life a constant pageant of triumph in Christ. That's what Paul's saying. You can defeat me, but you can't defeat God. You know, circumstances may sweep me away. Circumstances will never sweep God away. That's what David said in that psalm when he talked about the flood waters. Remember, David said the flood waters, and David... He got in some pretty deep floodwaters, didn't he? And David said, I learned that the floodwaters just about wiped me out, but the floodwaters will never wipe God out. He's higher than them. He's greater than them. So the problems that come our way cause us to lift our eyes to God as our resource, as the one that we can be thankful for, and the one that we can be trusting in. So Paul says it's onward even through our weakness. Even though we're all frail, even though we all have these problems, and even though we're all like this, Paul says, God, lead us onward. Who else would we have leading us? He's the one that should be leading us, is God. And that's what Paul says. Paul gives all the credit to God. And if you look at Paul's life, I mean, the world looks at Christians and just laughs, right? Boy, you guys are a mess. You know, you've been defeated. You know, you, you and your crutch religion, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how about Paul? I mean, people that are in the ministry, it's even worse for them. You know, and that's, if you looked at Paul's life, you'd have said, this is a defeated man. You know, and that's, some of them said that about him. Oh, he's weak. He's old. He's frail. He can barely talk. He can barely write. He's a crippled epileptic, as one lady told me. But Paul says, yeah, I am. But he's going to say later on in this book, 
that through my weakness, God worked. Through my frailties, God worked. And, and uh, that's what Paul is saying here. And look where the victory is at. He said the triumph is in Christ. It's not in Paul. It's not in the Corinthian church. You know, we want to do that, don't we? We want to trust in ourselves. God says don't do that. We want to trust in our church. The Bible says don't do that. The Bible says trust in God. Trust in Christ. There's, he's the one that will never let us down. And that's what Paul says. And this word triumph, it means to conquer. I mean, it's pretty simple, isn't it? So Paul was marching as a victor with Christ through the world. That's what Paul's doing. You know, Paul is not following a fad. Paul is not following a religion. Paul is following Christ. And that's what he says. The triumph in Christ, I am following Christ. He is leading this, this parade. So there's, there are three victories here in this text. It's, it's God's victory. Um, it's it's uh, Paul's victory. And it's the gospel's victory. There are three victories here. And Paul brings them out and uh, for us to see. And, and you see that little word causes there in verse 14. I mean, he, it's just leading. That's the leading. God leads us to triumph. That's what Paul's saying. So, you know, whatever battlefield you're on, whatever battlefield I am on, whatever war we are in, whatever difficulty we are in, we all have to look to God. We all have to look to Christ. He's the one that's going to come out onto the battlefield with us. He's going to meet us where we are. He's going to come to those circumstances, whatever those circumstances might be. And Paul says, Christ leads us in triumph over our circumstances, over our difficulties. And that word savor here, it's, a, it's, it's an imagery. You know, Paul, a lot of times, Jesus used a lot of imagery, didn't he? If you like parables and imagery, Jesus, the Gospels are full of them. But it's kind of rare for Paul to do it. He's an older guy, kind of like me, just a facts man. Well, Paul just gives us the facts here, but he's also showing us a fragrant odor here, uh, this perfume of knowledge that Paul's talking about. He says the knowledge, and that's what the preaching is. That's what the ministry is. It's making known. And that's what Paul said he's doing. He is making known this God. He is making known this Christ who has triumphed over this world. Now, when some people preach the gospel, they preach a defeated Jesus. Well, Jesus in the Bible is not a defeated Jesus. He's the triumph one. He's the one to come out of the grave. He's the one that's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's the one that's going to come back any minute, and he's going to make immense meat out of this world. He's a warrior. Some people don't like that about Jesus. They just they get all nervous. Well, who do you think is going to take this world over? It ain't going to surrender. He has to take it over. That's the book of Revelation. That's this Jesus. That's this God that we serve. He has risen in triumph over everything and everybody. There's not a corner of this universe he does not own. And that's what Paul knows. I triumph in him in every place, Paul says here in verse 14. Every place he's preached. You know, sometimes we've got to keep our mouth shut, right? We, you know, people were at work and they own us there, or we're here and they. You know, we can't say anything, and we got to keep our mouth shut. But there are times whenever we don't have to keep our mouth shut. And that's what Paul says. In every place I open my mouth, every place I preached Christ, know that, that there was this triumph, uh, as he talks about here in verse 14. So, you know, it's, it's laying hold of God's providence and God's sovereignty. Those are two big things. You know, and if you're a new Christian or you are not a Christian, you say, what is the sovereignty of God and what is the providence of God? People have written books on these two things. I mean thick books. So you better get some of them and start reading them. You better get this book and start reading it. God is in absolute control. A hair of your head cannot fall to the ground that he doesn't know it. A sparrow can't die that he doesn't know it. That's our God. And he's the one that comes to our rescue, this God. 
He's the one that caused Christ to triumph. And uh, Paul has a lot of confidence. And that confidence is in God. You know, that's me. I don't have, I shouldn't have any confidence in myself. I shouldn't have any confidence in the flesh. I shouldn't have any confidence in anything other than God. But I should have com complete and total confidence in God. That's where my confidence needs to rest, is in Him. Because He knows better than I do. And that's what Paul says in every place. So the providence and the sovereignty of God give Paul great confidence. Wherever he went, it should be the same for us. You know, they can shut you and I up, but they can't shut God up. Paul says that in 2 Timothy, didn't he? You, they put me in prison, but you can't put the word of God in prison. People shut us up, but they can't shut God up. And Paul knew that. That's the God that Paul served. And Paul says here, um, when, when we were manifesting the, the perfume, if you will, of his knowledge. You know, that's what Paul was doing. Paul says that, Paul says that, you know, to use a modern term, Paul says, I was the media for God in every place. So that's what you and I are. We're the media for God. Now, no TV back then, no radio, no internet. And the word media, that's an English word, but it means middle ground. The middle ground, that's what Paul says, I'm the middle ground. I'm the middle ground between the people that I preach to and the God that wants me preaching to them. Paul says, I'm the media. And that's what preachers and teachers are. We're the media. You know, we're the means of God's mass communication. we got to get the word out. That's the church. Get the word out. That's Christians. Get the word out. But sometimes we get listeners that end up falling captive to what's being said, and they would rather not listen. God's got you right where he wants you. And that's what Paul says. In the saved and in them that perish. So there are two groups here that Paul is talking about. He spoke to in, in two places or in both places. So, you know, and, and because people won't listen, does that mean we shut down the message? That's one of the first temptations for a preacher. Well, no one's going to show up. No one's going to listen. Nobody wants to hear that. Well, it hasn't changed one bit. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, Paul quotes Isaiah from the Old Testament who said, who has believed our report? So there are people who are listening who don't even want to be listening. Don't let that phase you, Paul. Don't that, let that phase you, preacher. Don't let that phase you, teacher. You keep right on teaching. You keep right on preaching. And Paul said over in 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, he said to them, he said, God tested my heart. You know, God wanted to know if I was going to be a man pleaser or I was going to be a God pleaser. You can't be both. If you want a big crowd, be a man pleaser. If you want to be a God pleaser, you're probably not going to have a big crowd because people run off. And Paul says, he was made known his knowledge by us in every place, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Now, on the, there's the perfect tense here on the saved. People don't become unsaved. We need to use biblical terms here. So Paul's talking about the saved here. Those are people who, who were lost, who got saved. They were formerly those who were perishing. And, and in the text here, there is the present tense that there are some people who are being saved. In other words, they've heard the gospel, but they haven't been saved yet, but they're going to be. You know, that's what happened to me. I was running from God at a pretty high rate of speed, and somebody got me cornered and gave me the gospel, and I hated every minute of it. But there was something intriguing about it. I was like, it can't be. God hates me. God doesn't love me. God wants, you know, God wants to rain on my parade. You know, God doesn't love me and care for me and want to be gracious to me and want to give me salvation. I didn't know those things about God. But somebody got me cornered and shared the gospel with me, and I found out God really does love me. 
I found out Jesus really did die for me. I found out what the reason his shed blood was for. It was for me and my sins. So there are people who are not going to listen. There are people uh, who are lost, who are never going to get saved. Those are there as well. So we have three groups. We have the saved, we have the being saved, and we have the lost. And what I started to say was it took me two years. A fellow came and shared the gospel with me and took me through the Bible and did a fantastic job giving me the gospel. And it took me two years. I was no, 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 no for two years, 24 months. I made excuses. And he told me once, he said, well, what would you do if you were drowning and I tried to throw you a life preserver and you pushed it away? I would say you were crazy. He said, that's what you're doing to God. God is trying to save you. You're perishing. He's throwing you a life raft and it's the person in the work of Christ. Please, please. Receive this gift. Boy, I didn't like all that. They put it all right back on me. I was blaming God. Now, now all of a sudden, it's on me. And it took two years for me. I know there are other people that, you know, uh, one example in the book on Providence, it was 70, 80 years where a man heard the gospel as a child and he was uh, just about on his deathbed and run back down to the church and talk to the pastor where they came and talked to him. And it's like 70 years later. So my two years don't seem so long. But don't put it off. There's an urgency to this. You could die. How many people have we buried in this church in the last year? I hate to remind some of you of some of our friends that have left, but next year at this time, I might not be here. You may not be here. So we don't have any time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. There is an urgency to this. Don't put it off. And Paul says, in them that are saved and in them that are perishing. So you're perishing until you get saved, even if you've heard the word of God, even if you've heard the gospel. James says, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater judgment. So there is an enormous responsibility to this. I'm sorry to have to, to share all these things with you, but it's my responsibility as a teacher and a preacher of God's Word. I can't sugarcoat this. I can't change things that are here, you know. And God came and saved me. God can save you. And about this, in them that are saved and in them, them that are perishing, this is, this is nothing new. I mean, we knew this, right? The Old Testament talks about this. And remember, Simeon, I can't wait to get to heaven to meet Simeon. Remember, he was in the temple when Mary showed up with the baby Jesus. And you remember what Simeon said about baby Jesus? Let me remind you. This child is set for the fall and rising of many, and a sword shall per pierce through your own soul, and the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. So, there's no other way. There's not plan B. There's not a, another way to heaven. There's not a, you know, a less assaulting way for your pride and your sin. There's only one way, and it's through the person and the work of Christ. God has done these things. We just need to come to him on his terms. In verse 15 says we are a, uh, you know, for those who preach the gospel, Paul says, for those who preach the gospel, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. So we're, we're perfuming to God. We're pleasing to God. You know, people today want to know, they think God wants their money or God wants their talent or God wants their this or God wants their that. He owns everything. He's got plenty. You want to know what pleases God? Preaching the gospel of his son. You want to please God? Go preach the gospel of his son. Right here, that's what it says. You'll be well-pleasing to God. And that's what Paul says. This is well-pleasing to God when I preach the gospel. Whether people are saved or perishing or, you know, it's, it's well-pleasing to God, this gospel preaching is. In the Greek, it says, because we are the aroma of Christ to God the Father. That's what the text says here. So, uh, Again, there's nothing more pleasing to God right now than the preaching 
of the gospel. Telling people about what God has done. People are waiting on this and waiting on that, waiting on, you know, going to Mars, waiting on, you know, is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that have been done. And what has been done is the greatest thing that was ever done. And that was God sending his son to this earth to die for our sins. Sins are paid for in full. And God's open arms are, are waiting. And there's no need for you to perish. Everything's been done. What a message. What a God. What a gospel. How can we not preach this? How can we not teach? This is what, this is what works. You think you're miserable. You ought to see me when I was in my mid-20s. Thought I had everything figured out. Yeah. I had a lot of misery and woe. And so did everyone around me. And it was all my fault. So misery is one of those things that is just a result of sin. It's a result of being absent and alienated from God. That's just who we are. And that's who needs to get saved. Because the Bible says that we are ungodly. Don't clean yourself up and try to come. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not the gospel. God, The gospel says that God can save the ungodly there in Romans chapter 4. I love that. We're enemies of God, Romans chapter 5. And when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. God has met your need. God has met my need. We don't have to clean ourselves up. We can come as we are. And he says, and them that are saved. Again, that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a biblical term. Paul didn't say, uh, you know, in uh, them that go to church. A lot of people go to church and aren't saved. He didn't say those that are baptized or a lot of people that have been baptized and aren't saved. He used biblical language. Saved. So either you're saved or you're not. Is that clear? And you're saved through what Christ has done for us, through this, as Paul says, the knowledge of God. And I don't want to reduce the gospel to knowledge because it's more than that. You know, Jesus coming and dying on this earth, it's not a fairy tale. Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, you know, the big bad wolf, those are all fairy tales. Never really happened. But this really happened. It's not a fairy tale. God became a man for a reason. And you are that reason. Jesus shed his blood for you to die and to pay for your sins. That's the only thing that can do it. And that's the efficient way. So God can and will save us. So gospel preachers, you know, we, we just simply make the truth known. That's all I can do. You know, I used to, when I was younger, get frustrated because people didn't get saved and my brother, my family, my friends, those that I thought for sure would get saved, didn't get saved. I thought, did I do something wrong? No, Paul says here, you didn't do anything wrong. You did what God wanted. Now the results are up to God. So we got to leave these things with him. And sometimes it remains a mystery. You know, I can tell you stories and I'm sure... You know, you have been around people long enough to know that, that, you know, there was somebody you thought would never get saved, and they did. So that's God working. So sometimes we don't know about the results until years later. I mean, I had guys come back and hunt me down who I talked to years ago, and, you know, I like to do the same thing. I like to go and hunt the guys down that came and talked to me and say thank you for what you did, and, and uh, it is so important. So, you know, people may not be thanking you now. You know, people may not be uh, impressed with you now, or people may not, you know, uh, shake your hand and say, you know, thank you for giving me the gospel. That's just not going to happen, but we leave the results to God. Maybe it'll happen later. So uh, there's a threefold purpose here for the preaching. First of all, it pleases God. Why should we preach the gospel? It pleases God. 
That's it. You say, well, I want another reason. No, there is none. Preaching the gospel pleases God. He has accomplished the greatest thing that was ever accomplished in this universe. He wants every single person in this universe to know that. And our job's not done until we get this done. So to God, there are two groups. There are the perishing and there are those, those who are saved. And again, the preaching doesn't always please men, but uh, we leave that to God. And sometimes it even disappoints saved people. You know, I've, you know, you've had it happen. Maybe somebody comes and starts witnessing. Somebody doesn't know you're a Christian and they start witnessing to you, you know, and, and that's happened to me a couple of times and get a smile on your face and you're like, yeah, please tell me all about this. Let me, let me, let me hear this. And, you know, people don't know that maybe you're a believer and that's a great thing. But there, but there are other people that don't even want that to happen. It's like a selfish thing, you know. I'm saved. I know the gospel. It's me and God. I don't want anybody else to go to heaven but me. That's a miserable life, isn't it? But that wasn't Paul. Paul said, I've got to share this knowledge in every place there in verse 14. And... Look where the responsibility, if you will, of the, the perishing and the unbelievers rests. It rests fully on them. Okay? It's not God's fault people are lost. It's not the gospel's fault that people are lost. You know, it, it, it can save anyone who will come by simply trusting Christ as Savior and believing on Him, and we use all those terms. And salvation is a free gift that we must receive. But this says, you know, that there's, you know, the, 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 the perishing, and, you know, there are people who hear this over and over and over. You know, maybe in your own family, maybe, you know, somebody you work with, somebody in your neighborhood, so many of your classmates from years and years ago, you've witnessed to them and you've witnessed to them and you've witnessed to them, and they remain in unbelief. Well, that's not your fault, and that's not the gospel's fault. That's their fault. And that's what this verse says. Don't blame God. Don't blame the gospel. Don't blame the preacher. The blame clearly lays at the feet of those who are perishing. They're responsible. They're responsible to God. And it's a tragedy, isn't it? You know, they're, they're, you know this war that's going on, I mean, it's the, the, the physical war that we see is enough, but it's nothing like the spiritual war that's going on. That's what the Bible says. You know, this great war, Romans, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the spiritual battle that's going on. There are casualties. Wish there weren't, but there are. And that's what Paul says, in them that perish. These are the ones that are going to be the casualties of these things. There's nothing worse than hearing the gospel over and over and then rejecting it over and over again. That's a terrible thing. That's a sin. And it's a privilege to preach the gospel. It's a privilege to hear the gospel. It's a privilege. So when somebody you're saved and somebody you don't even know comes up and starts witnessing to you and giving you tracks and making sure you're saved, that's a wonderful thing. Thank God for that. And we need more of that. And um, Paul says here in verse 15, he bears the sweet odor of Christ in, in preaching this gospel. And not everyone is going to benefit from it. That's no fault of God. That's no fault of the gospel. That's the fault of those who are not participating in it. That's what this says. Responsibility clearly lays at their feet. Then verse 16, you can strike the we are there in italics. doesn't belong. To the one, the savor of death unto death. To the other, a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? There are no verbs in this uh in this text. And Paul, Paul says, 
he 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 clearly says they're dealing with God. You know, this is what preachers need to know, and this is what hearers need to know. You know, this this is you're dealing with God when it comes to the gospel. When it comes to whether you're saved or you're lost, or whether it comes to what Christ has done to the knowledge of God, et cetera, et cetera, that Paul is talking about here, um, you know, you know, these things are um, directly from God. It's it's on His authority I speak, not mine, not the churches. And that's what they asked John the Baptist. Remember, to try to get him sidetracked. People do that. They think you know you're important, so I'll talk about how important you are and divert you from the gospel. That's what they did to John the Baptist. Are you? No. Are you? No. Are you? No. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He passed the test. And Paul says the same thing here. We don't, we, we don't want to get sidetracked. Gospel preachers are speaking for God. And that's what Paul says about preaching and teaching here. And uh, it's, a, it's an incredible responsibility, isn't it? Is it easy to preach the gospel? It's not. Go try it. You know, you're going to run into a, a lot of trouble because of this sinful world. But that shouldn't hold us back. You know, we, we need to go listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel, regardless of what happens, regardless of whether people like it or not, regardless of whether we're welcomed or not, regardless of anything, we need to obey God and go into all the world, preach this precious gospel, and leave the results to God. That's what Paul says here. To the one, a savor of death unto death, to the other, life unto life. He kind of reverses what he said in verse 15, we still only have two groups. So there are only two groups in this world. It's not the Baptist and the anti-Baptist. It's the saved and those that are perishing. Those are the two groups. You're, you're in one or the other. You're in one or the other. You can't get out of one, and you need to get out of the other. If you're saved, you can't. Your regeneration only happens once. You're born again once. You know, a birth happens once, not over and over. So you got to be born again, right? You got to come into this new world. I've seen a few babies this past week, fresh babies. And uh, that's what happens when you get born again. You, you, you become a child of God, a babe. And, and your needs are plenty. And God will help. God will help with the church. God will help with other Christians. God will help with his word. If you're born again and you come to faith in Christ, please let everybody know because we want to help you with this. And Paul says, To the one a savor of death unto death, to the other a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So, no neutral ground. You say, well, I, I don't like this. I just, you know, I want to be in the middle. You know, and I met people like that. You know, well, I'm not pro God. I'm not anti God. I just can I just stay in the middle? And what's the answer to that? There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. You're either saved or you're perishing. No purgatory. No second chance. I ran into people that think that. Well, after I die, God's going to give me a second chance, and then I'll do this. Well, that's a lie from the pits of hell. There's no second chance. It has to be done here in this life. Today is the day of salvation. This must be done before you die. And there are three deaths, by the way. One of them you've already experienced. It's spiritual death. All those little babies, they're so beautiful. But you know what? They're separated from God. They're born that way. Now, if they die in that state, I know they're going to go to heaven. You know what? This isn't, message is not about that but they're born separated from God. Those little heathens need to get saved. And not many people will tell you that. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Every one of them need to be born again. They're separated from God. There's no neutral ground. You know, and uh, God wants us 
to come to him. And that's, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible talks about death and life. I started down that death road. There's the, there's the spiritual death that we're all born with. There's physical death that someday we're going to die. And then there's the second death way back there in the book of Revelation. Everyone that's not saved, this perishing, is going to be thrown into that lake of fire. I can't. There's not, a, there's not a, a, another option. That's what the book says. That's what the book says. That's what God says, not what I say. And Paul, no wonder he says he's trembling. Who's sufficient for these things? <laughs> once you start down this road, once you, you see these things and what, what we're responsible for as a preacher and a teacher and what you're responsible for as a hearer, it makes us tremble. Even Paul, who is sufficient for these things? And that sort of starts verse 17. He says, for we are not the many who corrupt the word of God. Those, those people, that's who Paul is talking about. The corruptors, they're not sufficient. Why? They're, they're spreading lies. They're spreading lies. So, so before I move on to that verse, we need to pray for the gospel preachers, and we need to pray for those like our missionaries and the folks in our own community, many of you. We need to pray for the souls of the people in this community and in our families. Prayer is a part of this too. We don't want anyone to perish. We're like God. He's not willing that anyone should perish, so that should be our prayer too. And... Um, you know, the gospel is free. You know, salvation is a free gift. That's what the Bible says. And if I'll say it again. If the gospel you're preaching is not free, you're preaching the wrong gospel. God did all the work. You need to make room for the gift. And he'll give you the faith to do that. He can save any. He saved a thief on the cross. I mean, how many people in your life has he saved? Um, you know, God's not picky. He'll take anyone if you come to him through Christ. So this who here, it, it strikes out all this self-sufficiency and this adequacy. For me, I'm not sufficient. I'm not adequate. You know, who am I to think I, am a, I should be doing this? But this is a privilege. To hear it, it's a privilege to preach it. It pleases Almighty God. Why can't we do this? This is how people get saved. They listen and hear about what God has done, Almighty God. So Paul says, who is qualified for this career? God didn't go down to the gym and get Superman or Arnold Schwarzenegger to do this. He got poor old Paul. Who everybody laughed at. Well, they laughed at Jesus. So I'll laugh at you. So don't worry about those things. No one is sufficient for these things except those who find their sufficiency in God. Well, that's what chapter 3 starts out. Turn over to chapter 3 and verse 4. Paul says, and such trust have we through Christ toward God. So all Paul's confidence is still in this arena, not in himself. And then he says, not that, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So Paul says, God has enabled me to do this. God gives gifts. And, you know, that's... And God gives the responsibility, and that's what Paul had. He had the responsibility, he had the gift, and Paul knew that the sufficiency that he had was not of himself. It came from someone else. It came from God. And you know, that, that's something that these false teachers don't have. False teachers don't have a reverence for God. Oh, they want you to call them. Oh, but. He wants you to call him father, you know, and the Bible clearly says, call no man your father upon the earth, but boy, they, they, love, they love it. And that's what it says. Oh, they love those things. No reverence for God. 
No, no, uh, I'm not adequate for these things. And that's what Paul says. I, I just have a reverence for God, an honest for God in this job, in this occupation, in this preaching the gospel, this responsibility, and I must persevere. I just can't go for a few days. Paul, he, he just got to keep going. That's what he said in every place. He went to Corinth. He went to, to, to Macedonia. He went to Philippi. He went all these places and preached the gospel. God led him there. And then in verse 17, for the, we are not as many who corrupt the word of God. So just as there are only two places, saved and perished, there are only two kinds of preachers. Like Paul, who preached in Christ and the knowledge of Christ in every place, or those who corrupt the word of God. There's no middle ground. Paul says there's a gulf between these two. And that's what he says. We are, and the many, he says, the, the few are those who aren't corrupting the Word of God. The many are those who are corrupting the Word of God. There are more liars than there are truth-tellers. Why should that surprise us? But that's what Paul noticed as well. So there's only two kinds of preachers, the snake oil and the pure gold. Paul says, I got the pure gold. I don't need the snake oil. And these corruptors, that's what they were doing. That's who they are. They, they adulterate. That's what that Greek word, it's a cheap imitation. And they'll sell it for any price. That's what Paul says about these people. They're hucksters. They, they sell a Christianity. They sell a Bible. They sell a Jesus that is weak and needy. The Jesus of the Bible is not weak and needy. You aren't going to bruise him. He's going to bruise you. And that's what the Word of God says. We have a him in the book of Revelation. He's going to take this world over. So Paul says they, they tone things down to attract buyers. You know, they put cheap prices on them to attract buyers. Paul says we don't do that. We don't put a cheap price on salvation to attract buyers. We preach the truth, whether men like it or not. We preach the truth regardless of the results. Paul said, I'm a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. But, but look, he says, as of sincerity, that means from his heart. His heart's in this. He's not just being cold. You know, I told you guys you're going to hell. That's not Paul. Paul says, I'm warning you about hell. With sincerity and love and compassion. And if you come to Christ, I'll help you. That's what Paul says. But as of God in the sight of God, speak we Christ. God says, and I am under the microscope. God has me under the heat lamp, and I can't do anything but what he says. That's a terrible place to be, my friends, but that's a great place to be. And he enjoyed it. And he enjoyed pleasing God. That's what he says up there. He thanks be to God. He, he takes it right back to God. He, you know, I'm, I'm above the circumstances. I'm above all these things. And Paul says, I thank God. Everything that I've been through, up and down, up and down, that sea line and that coastline there of the Middle East, Paul says, God's been with me. He's caused me to triumph in Christ. So God supplied this sufficiency. So we have to give our ears. We have to give our hearts. We have to give our minds what God has said. It takes all of us. And also our feet. we got to go. And that's what Paul did. He went. He went to every place. Every place that God opened a door, every place he had an opportunity. Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. What an example he is 
of these things. And this sincerity here that he's talking about, is, it's, it means, you know, as from God. And, uh, you know, and, and it is, and it's the Word of God. Look, he says there, we corrupt. What are, what are they corrupting? The Word of God. It's not a church. It's not a, you know, movement. It's not a program. It's none of those things. They are tampering with the Word of God. Many of them have Bibles. Many of them stand behind pulpits. Many of them have TV shows. Many of them have radio programs. Paul says we're not like the many who corrupt the Word of God, but out of sincerity and as of God in the sight of God, speak we Christ. So that... That sincerity, that uh, the, the pure milk of the word, as Peter calls it. And uh, remember, when Paul left the Ephesian elders, what did he say? He says, I have not failed to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. That was his job. And that's the teacher and preacher's responsibility. Every verse, every chapter, every book, Genesis to Revelation, we can't pick and choose. We have to take it all. And Paul says, who's sufficient for these things? Certainly. Certainly not me. I'm not self-sufficient. Paul was not either, but he said, God, God's word has a way of doing its work. All we got to do is turn it loose. It doesn't need apologies. It doesn't need programs. It doesn't need band-aids. It doesn't need propped up. It doesn't need a spotlight. It doesn't need amplifiers. Sorry. God speaks pretty clearly from his word. Over 40 times in the Bible, the Bible talks about the word of God. What, what do you have in your lap? The word of God. And here it is. Psalm 19, we read this morning, it's the Word of God. It says, it can make wise the simple. I qualify. I'm simple. I need things simple. And God knows that. God has come to the lowest level and sent His Son to die for our sins and shed His blood and to provide a perfect salvation for us. And there are positive and negative things in the Word of God, and we just can't pick and choose again. And, and uh, it's not our job to do that. That's why, I like, that's why I like going through the Bible verse by verse, because I don't have to say, Lord, what do you want me to preach next? It's here. It's here. So we benefit from a systematic study of God's Word. We've got the Old Testament, we've got the Gospels, we've got the Epistles, and we've got the book of Revelation. It's all here. What's God, think? What's God have to say? You have it, and I have it. It's called the Word of God. Paul says, speak we in Christ. That's where it's at. So everything goes back to Him. You know, there's no Gospel without Christ. There's no truth without Christ. There's no salvation without Christ. But there, but there is these things in him. He has so wonderfully and sufficiently supplied it. And Paul says there's, there's a lot of false media filling the air in Corinth. That was those who were corrupting the Word of God. And again, a great gall fix between them. But uh, Paul sees that, and Paul's warning them about these things. So turn over to, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to show you this verse where, where Paul said here in chapter 2, in verse 1, you know, people ask, how do you start a church? How do you start a Bible class? How do you start something for God? The Word of God, that's how you do it. I remember when I went over to South Africa and spent some time with Mike and met Sergio. And Sergio told me he was the first fruits in Africa. 
he was the first person saved. And it's an amazing thing to look back at what God has done and can do through his word. And when you find out that you know, somebody flew on a 16-hour trip to bring you this message, it's that important. It's that important. And Paul, he says here, he went to Thessalonica. He, he started the church in Thessalonica by preaching the gospel. He started the church in Corinth by preaching the gospel. He started the church in Philippi by preaching the gospel. God brings the results. And he says here in verse 2, or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1, For ourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully treated, as you know, at Philippi, that's the Acts 16 where Paul got thrown in jail. So throwing Paul in jail caused him to stop preaching the gospel. No. He preached it to the he preached it to the jailer. He says, We are bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So see Paul's authority. It's from God and God's word. God is working. God is pleased when we preach the gospel. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor guile. That's the guys that he's talking about, the corruptors, the hucksters. He says, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, God's trusted us with his gospel. It's ours. It's ours. It saves us. We've been born again by it. We're, we're kept saved through it. All those great and wonderful things about the gospel, but we need to pass it on. We've been put in trust with this gospel. It changes people. Jailers, that's why Paul was not afraid to preach it to the bailiff and to the jailers there and to the criminals. It saves criminals. It saves bailiffs. It saves police officers. It saves criminals. And he says, and here's what I wanted, not as pleasing men. Paul said, I, I was trying to please men. I wouldn't be doing this. I was trying to get a crowd. I wouldn't be doing this. And he says, who tests our hearts. For neither at any time, use, he didn't even use flattering words. Paul didn't say, well, you know, I'm winking and nod about these things. You know, with God, maybe they're true and maybe they're not. No, my friends, these things are true. There's no winking and nod. And as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, Paul was not in it for the money. And God is his witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you. I wasn't trying to make you happy, Paul says. Were we willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but our own souls, because you're dear unto us. So that's, Paul said God opened up people's heart and slips the gospel in there and saves them and then brings the love Sergio has a great love for that church in South Africa. Brought him the gospel. I have a great love for those who brought me the gospel. And Paul says, that's what happens. You're going to get saved and look back and you're going to say, man, I owe you a lot. You told me about Jesus. You told me about the truth. And Paul says, I'm not a man pleaser. I'm a God pleaser and I'm going to leave these things to him. Turn back. To our verse, I'm out of time, and I got to quit. But thanks for being patient with us here. Verse 14, now thanks be to God who causes us always to triumph in Christ, makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a savor, a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one a savor of death unto death, to the other a savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as the many who corrupt the word of God, but as sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we 
Christ. Father, we thank you this morning for the Word of God. And it's not the Word of men. And Father, we're thankful that we have a God who has spoken. And we wonder what you would say, Father, if you had spoken, like Hebrews says. And Father, you've had a lot to say. You've had a lot to say about our sin. You've had a lot to say about how evil and wicked we are. And Father, we also are thankful that you've had a lot to say about your Son. And Father, what he has done for us. And Father, he cared not for his own self. Verses here in 2 Corinthians 9 about just how rich he was. And Father, he became poor. That we, through his poverty, might be made rich. And rich we are. And we're thankful for this great gospel of grace. Jesus died for our sins according to the word of God, and we're thankful. In his name we pray. Amen.